Hey, welcome everyone. We'll give people a few seconds here to uh, join us as we just hit, we just gone live. So you are in the right place if you're here for the pavement preservation longitudinal joints webinar. Okay, well, I see we have quite a few people attending right now. So I'm just gonna go ahead. I am Catherine Stanley. I am the program um, coordinator for the Minnesota LTAP program. Uh, today, I will be just doing a little intro overview of who Minnesota LTAP is, if you are unfamiliar with us. And then I'll be handing it over to today's moderator, Dan Wagman. So again, welcome everyone to today's webinar. This webinar is presented by the Minnesota Local Technical Assistance Program at the Center of Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota LTAP is sponsored by the Minnesota Local Road Research Board and the Federal Highway Administration. So the LTAP program was established in 1992 by the Federal Highway Administration and in partnership with Minnesota's Local Road Research Board. Minnesota LTAP is one of 52 LTAP centers nationwide. We are designed to provide local transportation agencies with the tools for improving operations. LTAP's ultimate goal is to foster a safe, efficient, environmentally sound transportation system by improving skills and knowledge of local transportation providers through training, events, demonstrations, technical assistance, and technology transfer. So Minnesota LTAP, we have a variety of training and education courses throughout the year. So we have annual events like our demo day. We have the Fall Maintenance Expo. We also have workshops, including pavement, asphalt pavement rehab, culvert installation and maintenance. And we also have a handful of online courses that are self-paced and on demand. So in addition to our training, we, Minnesota LTAP has a variety of other resources, including newsletters, our technology exchange, and our Exchange Express. We also have reference documents, videos, a comprehensive website, and we have library services that provide um, research um, and looking for, if you have um, an agency or a council member that wants some um, research, we could pull those research reports for you. And we all, as I mentioned, we have some technical document searches. In addition to training and education, we also champion innovation. So we have two programs. One is our Build a Better Mousetrap program. And this is a great um, program where you can submit an entry on everyday inventions, something that you did to make your job easier, more efficient. We select two winners every year who get awarded fabulous prizes and all of our entries into this program get entered into the national recognition program. We also have our operational research assistance program also known as OPERA. And this provides funding up to $20,000 for those projects that require some more assistance, specifically funding and time, um, more ambitious innovation projects. And if you are new to the Zoom webinar platform, along the bottom, you have a black ribbon the chat feature, feel free to communicate with attendees, including the panelists. You can raise your hand during this Q&A. Oh, in the Q&A, please submit your questions here. We will be taking questions at the very end after all panelists have spoken. Um, but as you think of questions, don't hesitate to submit them there. And to leave, you just hit the leave meeting button. And today we have four panelists. We have John Garrity with MnDOT, Craig Reynolds and Trey Wurst from Ingevity, and Dave Stansex from Asphalt Materials. And right now I will be handing it over to our moderator, who is Dan Wegman. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on longitudinal joints. The main reason for this webinar is twofold. Uh, one, I, I teach a pavement preservation class, pavement maintenance, pavement preservation every other year for CTS LTAP. And it's coming up this winter. Uh, we wanted to incorporate longitudinal joints into that class. So we're looking forward to your feedback because what I'll be doing is condensing a lot of what we learned today and putting it into a module for that class. And so 
the other part of it is we wanted to have it now so that you can utilize some of this technology in upcoming projects, especially if your projects are gonna go late season. Um, there might be a fair amount of projects going late season this year due to uh, coming out of the COVID um, issues. And so if you do have late season, remember that it's, it's very difficult to get density late in the year. And what we're gonna be talking about here is a lot of things you can do to help get better densities, especially at those longitudinal joints where you typically will have a problem getting good densities. And that will in turn, turn into issues later on in the pavement life. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. His name is John Garrity, and he has worked at MnDOT for the last 32 years, spending most of that time in the bituminous office. I have to say that I was lucky enough to uh, spend about four years with John in the bituminous office and enjoyed it every minute of it. Uh, he's also a graduate of North Dakota State University and a registered engineer in Minnesota. So with that, uh, John's going to talk about you know, kind of optimizing your construction procedures in order to get uh, better performance on your longitudinal joints. Take it away, John. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, are you seeing the correct screen uh, at the current time? No, you have to share it first. Oh, did I? Uh, there we go. Let's... Is it sharing yet? Not yet. Huh. I'm not why, sure why it won't share here. Just to share with the people online, uh, sometimes we have technical difficulties. I was on my computer this morning and um, all of a sudden it went into an automatic update. So I'm coming through on my phone now, but uh, looks like John's got her figured out and we'll let him take it over. Did it, did it finally come through? Yes. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Catherine and Dan for inviting me here today. Um, as uh, Dan mentioned, um, th th there's many people who are uh, at, at the webinar today, and I think that just uh, indicates what interest there is in the long longitudinal joint in terms of the impact that that has on the long-term performance of the, uh, of the asphalt pavement. You know, a lot of times it's the uh, ride which drives uh, the need for rehabilitation on a roadway, but uh, occasionally the, the longitudinal joint uh, is uh, performing so poorly that that actually requires the need for um, rehabilitation on, on the pavement. So uh, thanks uh, for everyone uh, coming today. And so today what I'd like to talk is uh, about is just uh, um, longitudinal joint construction. Okay, the longitudinal joint oftentimes uh, represents the weak link in asphalt pavements. And there, there's a couple of reasons for, for that. Uh, probably the biggest uh, item is that, that there's uh, lower density at, at the longitudinal joint. And then sometimes workmanship during construction can um, cause an issue with regard to uh, permeability. And, and that's really one of our biggest issues at the longitudinal joints is um, the cracks forming, which allow uh, water to uh, permeate the, uh, the uh, uh, pavement surface, resulting in uh, a, a, you know, more extreme cracking, um, raveling, and then ultimately complete uh, loss of, uh, of material at the, uh, at the longitudinal joint. So it's, it's important that uh, uh, the longitudinal joint be uh, looked at closely during, uh, during our, or actually before our construction activities and during our construction activities. 
Now I mentioned that uh, the the density at the joint uh, has a has a big impact on performance. Um, the slide that we're looking at right now, um, uh, one of my coworkers and I, uh, was probably about ten years ago, decided to look at density across the pavement. So. On the left side of the screen, um, just consider that the, the left joint and uh, we move all the way across, you can see that uh, we've got the 12 foot pavement width. And what we did was we took uh, nuclear readings every foot across the pavement. Uh, we, at the time, we were also just comparing a, a SEMA nuclear gauge to a uh, paved track or non-nuclear device. But, uh, um, but really what I want to show on this slide is that at the edges of the pavement, you can see we have the lowest density. And then as we move towards the center of the pavement, the density goes up and up, but uh, right in the middle of the pavement, you can see it dips down. And uh, then as we head uh, um, further to the right, uh, uh, right side of the pavement, the density will go up again and then drop down as we get to the edge of the pavement. Now, the uh, reason for that dip in the middle is uh, that's where the gearbox is. So typically we're gonna see a little bit less density, but uh, again, our concern now is the joints and uh, whether it's unconfined or a confined edge, you're never gonna see a straight line of mid-mat density um, at, at the longitudinal joints. It's just a, a fact that at the uh, edges, again, whether it's confined or unconfined, we're gonna have uh, lower density levels. And here's just some uh, interesting uh, uh, MnDOT longitudinal joint facts. Uh, about 98% of our uh, MnDOT's pavements um, rated in 2020 have at least some longitudinal joint distress, uh, mostly uh, low severity. And what we identify as low severity is just a uh, single crack at the longitudinal joint. But the troubling aspect is if we look at uh, um, um, about 35% of our bituminous roads rated in 2020 have uh, uh, medium or high severity longitudinal joint distress. And that would be multiple cracking and eventually loss of material. And here's what uh, we would identify as medium severity. And this was just a photo out of our uh, pavement management uh, van, and that's why the clarity isn't that good. Um, but uh, um, medium severity would be, you can see the multiple cracks on the roadway. And uh, as you would uh, guess, that's gonna be a, a perfect entryway for water into the uh, pavement. And then ultimately, um, those medium severities after um, the, the water is uh, infiltrating, we're going to end up with loss of material. And that loss of material sometimes can be extreme enough where if you've ever ridden a motorcycle, it's uh, one of those situations where you'd, you'd be afraid to uh, get your wheel into that uh, longitudinal joint for fear of uh, crashing out on the roadway. And, and those are what we're trying to avoid on our, on our pavements is uh, minimize the potential for both medium and uh, um, certainly for uh, severe uh, um, longitudinal joint distress. Now, some of the considerations that uh, we can look at for improving the longitudinal joint performance are before we even get to uh, the construction activity, there's some design elements we can look at. And then also during construction, there's certain things that we can do to help us improve the long-term um, performance of our longitudinal joints. Our design considerations, some of the things we should look at when we're designing our projects are um, on that final surface lift or the uh, lift which traffic will be driving on, the smaller the uh, maximum aggregate size we use on that uh, lift of material, it, it's going to minimize the uh, potential for um, uh, the, the pavement to be permeable. So as we reduce that maximum aggregate size, we're also... <laughs> Also reducing the amount of uh, material with, or uh, water that can be infiltrating the, uh, the pavement. We can also put a longitudinal joint density requirement on, on the project. And uh, at MnDOT, all of our projects include a longitudinal joint density requirement. Um, our local agencies in Minnesota um, have not had quite the same distress that we've seen on MnDOT's uh, system. So oftentimes they're not including the, the 
longitudinal joint density re requirement. But one of the things to remember is if we don't require a longitudinal joint density, people aren't going to be paying attention to it during construction. Another thing that we can do during um, design is set the project up so that we're milling and filling one lane at a time. And if you think about this, if we do co our construction activities this way, we're going to have confined edges on both sides of the pavement. And, and it's a, a fact that with that confined edge or something that the pavement abuts up to is that we're going to have a, um, a higher density level. And then um, also at MnDOT, we uh, use some longitudinal and joint enhancements. And uh, I'll talk about those a little bit later, but they would could include uh, fogging of the uh, longitudinal joint on that final driving surface or using um, longitudinal joint adhesives on the vertical face of the joint. And then Dave is gonna talk about uh, void reducing asphalt membranes a little bit later. And that's something that we're just beginning to look at at MnDOT here. Um, some of the construction considerations that we wanted to uh, look at is first of all, we need a straight reference line for the paver to follow. Um, and then also the uh, longitudinal joint construction technique itself, uh, the Maryland joint is what I'm gonna talk about today. And then where, where do we want the rollers placed on the mat when we're trying to compact the longitudinal joint? So we'll, we'll look at those things. Um, it, as, as you'd imagine, the, the joint is, only be as, is going to only be as good as, uh, as straight as we can make it. So in these photos, um, I think uh, some of you have probably seen these photos before, uh, I've seen them at other presentations, but but um, if you think about uh, a, a longitudinal joint that has as many scallops as these uh, on that first lift, think about how difficult it would be for that paver operator to uh, follow that closely and make sure that we have a uh, nice tight, uh, tight joint. It would be pretty much impossible. So, um, you know, we always recommend uh, that a reference line being be placed. And one of the best things to do is run a string line. Before I came to MnDOT, I used to work at a county and we'd always uh, put redheads out on the uh, pavement uh, for each successive lift. And then the contractor would be able to set their um, string line offset from, from our redheads. But uh, a reference uh, line of some type is needed to help ensure that we're going to have a, a straight line to follow. Um, and then the Maryland joint technique. Now this is interesting at, uh, um, for us in, in Minnesota because it was probably about eight years ago at, uh, we, we have an agency industry, we call it our technology group. And one of our assistant commissioners who was uh, um, a co-chair of that committee tasked the Minnesota asphalt industry with improving longitudinal joint performance. And so industry came up with uh, what we term the uh, Maryland joint construction technique. And um, all what that is, is um, when we're placing the uh, hot lane next to the adjacent pavement, we overlap that uh, pavement by an inch to an inch and a half, and we um, have it about an eighth of an inch higher. And uh, here's a schematic to uh, show you what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, and, and it's just, uh, so the hot mat is the lane that we're currently paving and you can see we have the screed just an inch to an inch and a half over on that previously placed lane and a little bit higher. Remember that uh, the consolidation of uh, asphalt is it's about a quarter inch for every inch placed. So we have to be a little bit higher, but by um, having that overlap rather than jo just trying to make the uh, joint flush with that hot mat, we are forcing material against that uh, cold joint. And, and so we don't have a loss of material. And, and that's the, the concern that we could potentially run into at the longitudinal joint is if we're just trying to make it flush, that paver operator is going to not always have that uh, material nice and flush against the previously placed lane. There could be a gap occasionally, and, and that's what can lead to that distress. But by having that overlap, we're always, we're ensuring that we're not going to starve material at that vertical face of the longitudinal joint. And here's just a, uh, from um, one of our paving projects here in Minnesota, 
you can see that the end plate uh, for the screed is actually over about, uh, you know, that inch to an inch and a half. And uh, we're uh, for sure forcing material against that, uh, against that vertical face. A again, we're just minimizing the potential for starving of material at the longitudinal joint. And um, compaction, again, we, we know at the joints we're going to have less um, density, but there are, uh, again, certain things that we can do during construction that can help us get the best density possible. And, and one of those is um, uh, in, in Minnesota, we always uh, recommend uh, rolling from the hot side. And when we're at that joint, um, whether it's a confined or an unconfined edge, having that six inch overhang or overlap and um, it, if we have the first uh, roller pass on the longitudinal joint, we're ensuring that we're compacting the mixed when, when it's hottest as compared to, let's say, our first roller pass, we're mid-mat. You know, during that time we're out at mid-mat, the longitudinal joint uh, mix is cooling down and it's just going to make it that much more difficult to compact. So ideally, we want that first roller pass over the joint, uh, you know, from the hot side with about six inches hanging onto that previously placed uh, placed lane. And now you can see that uh, we're compacting that little sliver, that inch to inch and a half, we're, we're um, com hitting that with the roller as well. And um, I just want to show you on this slide on that on that photo on the top right hand side, we can see that white line there. And what we've done is we've actually crushed aggregate on, on that inch to an inch and a half over overhang. Um, and, it, it, you know, aesthetically, it might not uh, be the most appealing, but it shows that we um, have constructed the, the Maryland joint efficiently the way that we want and we do have that material and and over time that crushed material will, um, it, you know, just abrade away and, and leave the uh, um, joint uh, um, uh, in the integrity that it uh, was uh, is meant to be. And, and so d don't worry about the white line that's left um, by the uh, crushed aggregate of, of the overhang. And then just the um, additional photos, that bottom photo, a little bit tough to see, but that's an unconfined edge. And you can see the uh, roller operator is overhanging that by about six inches. And then on that top left photo, we can see that uh, again, we've got the uh, the roller about six inches over the joint. And, and that's really critical um, in, in terms of getting density on that longitudinal joint. And this is just one thing I wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of. Um, you know, again, we're an inch to an inch and a half over and about an eighth of an inch higher. And we just want to just make sure that that uh, overlap is not too high. This was on a county project we had up in northern Minnesota where that overlap was left a little bit too high. And the concern was safety, especially for motorcycles and and an inexperienced driver possibly overcorrecting if the tire got hung up on that. So the, the county did require the contractor to come out and grind that down a little bit. So um, make sure that the inspectors are watching that during construction that that overlap isn't too high that could uh, cause safety issues. Um, and one of the things after we started uh, using the uh, Maryland joint construction method in uh, Minnesota, we were very concerned with, first of all, did it improve our densities and also did it reduce the permeability at the longitudinal joints. So um, another guy from our research section, Eddie Johnson and I um, uh, went to quite a few projects and just uh, um, uh, did permeability readings with that, that's that NCAT uh, permeameter. And then we also cut cores um, and on the permeameter, we uh, um, set kind of our gold standard as uh, just uh, mid mat, we would get a, perme a permeability rating, you, you know, figuring there's no joint there. So that should be the standard we're trying to meet. And then we um, put our permeameter, we put it over the joint. You can see uh, on the top of that uh, photo on the left there, there's that we used uh, plumber's putty to help make it uh, waterproof so water wasn't draining. And then we also took a uh, permeameter reading um, tangent to the joint. And then we also did the same with, uh, with our cores as well. So I'd like to just show you a little information we got on that. And um, again, our concern at that longitudinal joint is the susceptibility to pr um, pr or being permeable. 
And so again, our mid lane is our standard, what we're, uh, you know, there's no joint there. So that should be the, the, the best in terms of uh, being impermeable. So we can see, and, and that does show it on this, this slide here and tangent to the joint, um, is uh, shows the, the next best and over the joint uh, we've got some some permeability but uh, we wanted to compare that really what we were doing at the time was comparing that to our standard joint construction standard being just where we were um, making that joint flush where we didn't have the overlap and and you can see from uh, from the permeability readings though that uh, definitely the uh, uh, Maryland joint construction method is compared to just uh, a, a flush joint um, did reduce the uh, um, permeability on the, on the joint. And then in, in terms of the, uh, the density, um, it, it, what I've always found interesting is when we try something new, uh, the, the contractor is always super sensitive to it and really does a great job on it. Once they uh, get used to uh, the spe a, a newer specification, things uh, um, disimprove just a little bit, it seems like, uh, just because they're not uh, as, as sensitive to it. But uh, looking at the average density comparisons for our, our, our standard joint, you can see that the um, um, confined and the uh, unconfined joints are um, not as good as when they went to the Maryland joint uh, um, method. And also, if, if we look at the, uh, um, the, the joint center and the, and the joint tangent, we can see that uh, um, the, they all improved by using the Maryland joint con construction method. Now I mentioned that in, at Minnesota, we also use some um, longitudinal joint enhancements. And um, it, as, as I mentioned, we're routinely using the Maryland joint construction um, method on our projects now, but uh, I would say probably 70% of our projects were also using a joint adhesive. And we see that on the um, photo on the bottom left. And what that is, it's a rubberized asphalt. Uh, you can see it's uh, the, the person applying it has the kettle behind the uh, pickup truck and they're using a, a, a shoe to put that on the face of the joint. And, and what that's doing is that's basically trying to waterproof the, uh, um, the joint. So um, it's kind of a, a, a belt and suspenders type situation. You, you know, we are using the Maryland joint and, and additionally, we're using a joint adhesive on there. And again, what we expect to see is improved performance. And then on some of our pavements, um, not, not very many, but we have tried fogging of the longitudinal joint after, after it's paved. And we, we haven't seen as good a success with that as compared to uh, using the joint adhesive. And, and now just most recently, and what Dave is gonna talk about today is we've just, uh, we're just uh, actually this coming Friday, we're gonna finish up our provision for a uh, void reducing asset asphalt membrane specification, the VRAM, which Dave will talk about uh, uh, next, I think. But uh, here's just a slide of the permeability of, uh, um, again, mid lane, we would expect to see the least uh, permeability. And we just wanted to compare um, a joint with the uh, joint adhesive um, compared to a joint with tack. And uh, the, the, this slide just shows that the uh, with the adhesive, we're seeing uh, much better impermeability as compared to uh, a, a joint just uh, in, in this joint with tack on this one just indicates that it's uh, uh, tack on the vertical face. And um, this, I'm just wrapping up things here. I didn't want to leave this presentation without mentioning echelon paving. Echelon paving is really the uh, Cadillac method of longitudinal joint construction. Um, we try and do as much as we can um, in Minnesota. Logistically, one of the issues is, uh, you know, we need a shoulder wide enough to get the uh, mixed delivery vehicles to the paver. So typically you're going to need a 10 foot shoulder. What we're looking at here was out on Interstate 35 headed up towards Duluth, but uh, in our um, longitudinal joint provision, uh, we, we have it based on time. We say that the two pavers have to uh, be within 10 minutes of, of uh, one another, but uh, um, this is, is really the Cadillac method of longitudinal joint construction. And uh, so I did, I did wanna mention, uh, mention that as well. 
And so just in um, closing um, today, uh, the, the longitudinal joint performance is essential for long-term pavement performance. Uh, again, you know, we don't want that driving the need for rehabilitation on the pavement. And then also, improving the design for and the construction of the longitudinal joint will improve density and uh, decrease permeability and effectively in, in improve our long-term performance and durability of the, uh, of the asphalt pavement. So that is um, what I have uh, for today. So I'd like to thank, uh, thank you for the time. And uh, as uh, Catherine said, we'll, we'll take questions afterwards. So uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And um, there, the questions are actually in the uh, lower part of your screen. So if any of the speakers want to answer the questions as we go, that might save us some time at the end. Um, someone also asked uh, to elaborate a little bit on echelon paving. Okay, um, and, and, and I should have, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Um, but what, what echelon paving is, it's two, pavi two pavers running side by side at the same time. So we've got, uh, um, the, the, so basically what it's doing is it's forming a hot joint. Um, you've got uh, one lane, which, uh, you know, might, uh, the paver might be a hundred feet ahead of the uh, paver on the adjacent lane, but, but both, both lanes, so right and left lane are, are being paved simultaneously. And uh, that uh, um, uh, longitudinal joint formed by the uh, hot mix being pressed together just provides uh, a, a pavement with uh, just exceptional long-term performance and durability. And then Redhead's uh, Bridget, what that was is, is um, we just, uh, when we would run in center line on our pavement, it was just nails that we had uh, tied um, um, red ribbon to so so they would be easy to locate on on the pavement surface um, and then um, our, our density requirement for longitudinal joints in Minnesota on the confined edge okay our standard density requirement is 92 and on confined edge we have one percent less so it would be 91 percent and then on an unconfined edge it's a percent and a half less I, I, again that th there's just no way to get the same uh, level of density on a an on unconfined joint as compared to a confined joint thank you john appreciate that and the next speaker will talk about uh, other ways to get better density and reduce voids at the longitudinal joint. His name is Dave Stanzak. He is a specialty products area manager for asphalt materials, and he covers Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Northern Illinois. He has been uh, working in the materials area for the asphalt in industry since 2005, has a bachelor of science degree in commerce and master's of business administration from DePaul University. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Dan. I'll go ahead and share the screen. Hope you guys can all see that now. Um, get a presentation. Okay. Hope you can all see that now. Yep, yep looks good. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Dan and Catherine, for inviting me to be a part of this webinar today. And for my portion, we're going to be talking about a product, uh, as John already hinted at, uh, to improve longitudinal joint performance. And here we go. So the topics we're gonna cover, we're gonna talk about the typical issues that we see at the longitudinal joints. Then we'll explain why joints fail early. Um, and then we'll get into our product that we created, a void reducing asphalt membrane or VRAM for short. We'll talk about the concept of how it was created. We'll look back at some of the performance history of the first projects that used it. Uh, I'll discuss the different application methods for applying this material. We'll show you the special provision guideline that was created for this product. And then we'll look at some research that's been completed uh, by different states on this technology. And then last, Probably most important, we'll look at the life cycle cost analysis of this product and see what the real value is of it. So 
So first, we'd like to start off by just kind of asking the question of how difficult is it to find pavements that look like these? Obviously not too difficult because we just saw John Garrity's presentation. He showed similar pictures in Minnesota that look just like this, where you see a lot of failures at the joints. We see the cracking of potholes forming at the joints, but the rest of the pavement looks like it's in pretty good condition. So we ask you to think about how much time and cost goes into repairing or patching up the problems at the joints. I think if you really dive into it, you'll see it's pretty significant as far as how much time and money you're spending going out it's every, you know, maybe three to five years, fixing the joints and sealing them and, and fixing the potholes. And the other thing you got to think about is how much danger goes into repairing the joints. Uh, doing repair work on the joints is a dangerous for not only the drivers, but obviously also the construction workers, especially nowadays when we have so many distracted drivers looking at their phones. So why do we have the problems at the longitudinal joints? And you know, my presentation is similar to John's, kind of stating that the main issues that arise at the longitudinal construction joints. The main problem is you can't achieve the same density at the joint as you can the rest of the mat. So this allows for the water and air to penetrate, which eventually accelerates the damage at the joints. And as we just saw in the previous slides, the first area to fail and need maintenance on the pavement is typically at the joints because of all that water and air intrusion. So this is a Washington State DOT study that's often referenced. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Uh, but it highlights the relationship between in-place pavement ear voids and pavement service life. And I'll get the laser pointer out here, but as you can see, as ear voids increase, the service life is going to decrease. And in this graph, it shows that if you're getting 11% ear voids, which is typical, that's going to be take down the service life about a third. And this graph shows the typical ear voids found from the joint going towards the interior of their mat. And this is a little different graph, but it has the same concept that John Garrity showed in his graph, showing that as you start off at the joint, you'll typically see 11% ear voids. Um, and as you work towards the interior of the map, you know, as you go in each inch, this is an inches here, one inch, two inch going in, in towards the map. And as you can see, you have to get all the way to nine inches towards the interior of the map before you get to the intended target of your ear voids of 7%, which is typical in Illinois and in other states. So that nine inches on both sides of the joint, which is a total of 18 inches, you're gonna have higher ear voids than what you intend for. So here's the last two graphs combined in a simple statement. Pavements often face significant maintenance expenditures driven by the performance of a longitudinal joint five years before the rest of the pavement would reach a similar condition. So with longitudinal joint densities typically at 89-90%, it's easy to explain those opening photos of premature joint failures. So if we look at 89% density or 11% ear voids, we can expend, expect the joint performance to be lowered by 33%. So for a 15-year expected mat performance, uh, that we know in Illinois that's what they typically expect, 15 years of service life that if you're only getting 11% ear voids at the joints, the joint's gonna fail five years earlier than the rest of the mat. So you can see in this graph that's showing you you're only getting about 10 years at the joints versus 15 years at the rest of the mat. So what are the typical methods that are used? And John kind of highlighted some of them that the Minnesota uses, but we know that uh, most of them are mechanical methods. Um, you know, the first one listed on here is a specification method, the joint density requirements, but the other ones such as echelon paving, notch wedge joint, or the mill and inlay, they're all mechanical methods. And a lot of the customers we talk to uh, mentioned that they can help improve the joint, but they're still left unsatisfied with the performance of the joint over the years. So that's why our company decided there's gotta be a material solution to solve this issue. And this goes all the way back to the early 2000s that the Illinois DOT recognized the need for better joint performance and wanted to focus on permeability at the joints. So our company started working with the Illinois DOT to come up with the concept to fill a portion of the voids with an asphalt product from the bottom up, 
avoid reducing asphalt membrane or VRAM. So at this point, I wanted to stop and just talk a little bit about the terminology because some people might be from different states and have heard this called different terms, but basically all three of these terms, we're talking about the same thing. So in most states, it's referred to as avoid reducing asphalt membrane or VRAM. In Illinois, where they first created the product, the first term they came up with was longitudinal joint sealant. So that's how it's referred to in Illinois, but, but really only that state. And then the product we developed, as you can see in our slides, is called J-Band. So that's asphalt materials product and the trade name for our product we developed. But as I'm going through this presentation, you might see in the slides it being called different things, but we're talking about the same concept. So let's go back and look at some of the first projects that were done. And so in 2002, 2003, IDOT wanted to test this out on nine different uh, sections. So they looked at three different areas, uh, District 1, which is the Chicagoland area, District 2, which is out west towards Rockford area, uh, and then District 7, which is down in Southern Illinois. And all these areas were chosen based on the different traffic and climate conditions in the state. So the first project I want to look at is US 51, which is down in District 7, which is Southern Illinois. And these pictures were taken after 15 years. So 15 years after the product was placed, I came back and reviewed it and saw these pictures, which the picture on the left shows, uh, you know, now that we're talking about Illinois, we refer to it as LJS or longitudinal joint sealant. But the, uh, this picture shows a transition from the LJS section into the control section. And you can see the difference between the two there, pretty no noticeable. And then down here is the control section, which you can see a wider crack that needed to be filled in versus the LJS section uh, up on top. And then here's the second project. This was in District 1 down in Richmond Park on Illinois 50. And this is a suburb on the south side of Chicago. Picture on the left shows the LJS section. So you can see here, there's really not much of an opening of the crack, just a little bit of a quarter inch at the top, but it's holding up very well after 14 years. And the picture on the right shows a control section, which you can see needed to be uh, sealed and there's some potholes even forming towards the top here. And then the last job we'll take a look at here is in District 2, which is Illinois 26, and these pictures were taken 14 years after placement. The picture on the left shows the, shows the LGS section. And then the picture on the right is the control section. And then the picture in the middle shows the transition from the control section to the LGS section. So I hope you guys can see pretty clearly there's a significant difference after being down for 14 years and how well the, the joints are performing. And so really this is what got IDOT excited. You know, they, they kind of left these jobs down for a long time, came back and reviewed them, saw these pictures, did some testing and really got excited about the performance of this product. So they came back to our company and said that we need to create a specification for this and we need somebody to start mass producing this because we want to start using it on more projects in Illinois. So at this point, I figured I'd give you a break from listening to me present and, and show you a video that helps explain uh, the technology and what the product is and how it works. So I'll go ahead and play a two minute video for you guys that'll do a good job explaining it. Roads are the lifeline of your community. They represent a major investment for your agency. And longitudinal deterioration has always caused major problems. No matter what you do, more air voids mean that critical joint is bound to fail first. But now it's time to forget about failure. You can proactively preserve your joints with J-Band. J-Band is a major technological breakthrough, setting a new standard for void reducing asphalt membranes by significantly reducing air voids from the bottom up, literally. Here's how it works. As a part of the normal HMA construction process, J-Band is applied before the final lift under the eventual location of the longitudinal joint. Using an inline parallel spray bar, J-Band covers an area 12 or 18 inches wide based on the engineer's design. It's applied by a specialized, trained applicator at different levels of thickness and weights per foot. Once applied, J-Band bonds with the existing pavement and flows laterally no more than 10%. 
it's non-tracking in under 30 minutes. Next, hot mix asphalt pavement is applied. The heat causes J-band to migrate from the bottom up, filling voids in the joint up to 75% of the overlay height. Without J-band, the center line is flooded with water and air. With J-band, the longitudinal joint is almost completely impermeable. You may have already seen J-band at work. After being developed with state transportation agencies, J-band has been preserving roads in the Midwest since 2002. J-band is a proactive solution that saves time, money, and lives. It significantly reduces delays and the need for expensive, potentially hazardous maintenance or reconstruction. On the average roadway, every dollar invested in J-Band typically saves agencies $2 in avoided and deferred maintenance costs. It's time to invest in a major improvement. It's time to elevate your pavement performance with J-Band. So hopefully that video gave you a good understanding of how it works and what the technology is. Um, I got a little sample here. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is a sample of the product. You can see how thin it is. Um, it's really applied at about one gallon per square yard for an uh, inch and a half overlay. So you can see kind of how, the, how thin it is. But just a thick application of hot applied polymer modified asphalt and the VRAM will be applied at 18 inches wide. That video is a little outdated. Uh, some of the first projects we did, we did do just a 12 inch uh, wide application, but now all the states have been specifying 18 inch wide applications. Uh, and it's applied right before paving in the location of the new longitudinal joint. The VRAM needs to be non-tracking within 30 minutes, but normally it only takes uh, about five to 10 minutes before it's not tracking. I was on a project just last week where it only took two minutes to cool down uh, before it became non tracking. So, and it really, it's just based on cooling. So, it's applied at approximately 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And once it gets down below 120, uh, it'll be non tracking from there. And the picture on the right shows a paver covering uh, the first nine inches. And so, this is the other nine inches that's sticking out on the side. Um, and then right when it's applied, that heat is going to help the VRAM begin migrating upwards and to, you know, approximately two thirds up towards the surface of the uh, asphalt. And so there's different application methods, uh, but typically you're going to see it placed by a pressure distributor with mechanical agitation in the tank. Uh, the tanks are heated and do have agitation to make sure the heat is dispersed properly and uh, there's no cool spots uh, inside that tank. And most of the projects are applied with these kind of uh, trucks. There is a manual strike off box fed from a melting kettle that can be used. Uh, some of the first projects we did, we used this application method. And then last, there's also a, a tow behind melter applicator. There's a company now producing this uh, that can be towed behind a, a pickup truck. And this could work out well for some smaller projects. And here's the test requirements that's listed in the VRAM special provision. So you can see these are all AASHTO certified tests. Uh, there's five different test requirements. Uh, the, they are for dynamic shear, the creep stiffness, ash percent, uh, elastic recovery, and the separation of polymers. But there's the requirements listed here for what they need to meet in order to be a certified uh, void reducing asphalt membrane. And then here's our recommend, recommended VRAM application table. So we do have different application rates based upon the thickness, as well as if it's a fine graded or coarse graded mix. So you can see here's the coarse graded mix application rates, depending on the thickness, the fine graded mixes, which are typical and we know in Minnesota and, and Wisconsin, and the different application rates for those are, are obviously gonna be less because there's gonna be less voids for the VRAM to need to fill. And then there's also separate application rates for SMA mixtures, which we know are more commonly used now. So this kind of explains the math behind the application rates. And if we let's take a look at the effect of VRAM on the voids at the joints here. So if we take an HMA with five and a half percent AC applied at one and a half inches thick, 
there's going to be nine pounds of AC per square yard. Now, if we apply the VBRAM at a typical application rate of 1.47 pounds per foot, that will equate to 8.8 .8 pounds of AC per square yard. So in total, you're going to have 10.3% of AC at the joint when you combine the AC from the HMA and the AC from the VRAM. So there's a lot of AC, obviously, right at that joint. And so for a typical joint that has 10 to 13% ear voids, the VRAM will occupy two thirds of the overlay height, which is demonstrated in the picture below. So really that's what we're trying to target. That application rate is gonna be modified to make sure that the VRAM is migrating up to about two thirds. We don't wanna go all the way to the top and we need to get it over 50% at least. So we're really trying to target that two thirds range of the asphalt cement from the VRAM migrated up the surface. And now I want to talk a little bit about safety. Uh, there's also a safety benefit when you're using VRAM uh, that's going to help provide for your agencies. We understand that the goal is really to keep maintenance on the roads to a minimum, and VRAM can help you do this. One, since VRAM keeps the joints from fall uh, falling apart, it's preventing cracks and potholes from forming that can lead to accidents. Secondly, by using VRAM, you can avoid the lane closures for maintenance and repairs that make driving conditions more dangerous. And then lastly, if you can avoid having workers on the roadways doing repairs, you're obviously taking away that risk of injury or death that can occur when doing the roadway uh, repair work. And we also understand that rubble strips are playing more of an important part in keeping the road safe. And so we fully support this, the use of rubble strips and believe more effort should be really put in place to preserve the rumble strips because they're placed in the weakest area of the pavement. You know, right at the center line joints or outside edges. And you're also investing a lot of money into that area of the road too when you're doing the rumble strips and, and painting the lines. So we think VRAM is a great option to help preserve the rumble strips because it's going to reduce the air and water permeability there that obviously can be increased when you got a rumble strip there that can retain or hold the water or salt right at that joint. So we also recommend and think it's a good best practice to seal on top of the rumble strips to help reduce the water penetration. So doing a fog seal or RPE, a rapid penetrating emulsion, we recommend is also a good idea. And then I just put out here is a couple of flyers that we've created on preserving rumble strips with VRAM. And on the right here is actually an article that was uh, in the fall 2020 edition of uh, Asphalt Magazine, and it talked about VRAM for rumble strips specifically in this in this article. So now let's talk a little bit about the growth of this product. It's been growing rapidly over the last years, and we'll show you some of the research and then get into the life cycle cost analysis. So when J-Band was first commercially sold, which was in 2016, we did approximately 116 miles of paved roadways with VRAM in that year. And as you can see in this, in the graphs, each year went up. And in 2020, there were over 250, or excuse me, over 2,500 miles paved with VRAM. And we anticipate even more this year. And the use of VRAM is really expanding into more and more states. As you can see in this map, there's been 18 states plus Washington, D.C that have already used VRAM on some projects. And so one of those states that have started using VRAM on more projects is in Wisconsin. And these pictures are uh, from one of the first VRAM projects completed in Wisconsin, which was on County Highway H, which was done in August, 2018. And on this project, we had an engineering firm, which was Banky Materials Engineering. And they did some performance evaluation study on this project. And uh, in the report, they stated, and I quote, the use of VRAM will ensure an extended lifespan of a longitudinal joint without being bound to the production of the mix or the performance of the roller operator. The use of VRAM is one of the best material solutions used to improve joint performance rather than relying on mechanical solutions. So they kind of got to the conclusion that if you want to take out some of the variables of what the mix performance is going to be or how well they're going to roll the joints applying this material down kind of helps dummy proof 
those potential issues because you're going to have so much AC right at that joint. It's going to make it impermeable and keep density high for uh, right at the joints. And so the, the picture on the right here is I took this in January this year as I drove the road. And you can see how well the joint's still holding up. The whole road looked like it was in great condition. And so we recently completed two more projects in Wisconsin just this month. So in June, there was a project done in Sheboygan County and in Calumet County uh, using BRAM for the first time in those counties. And so this picture on the left, you can see it was done first thing in the morning, then spraying the J-band or the VRAM down on the road. And the picture on the right, you can see the paver coming across uh, the VRAM as they're uh, paving the first side of the road. But Wisconsin's doing more projects this year. We got different counties and uh, municipalities using it. And we're talking with the DOT too about uh, working on creating a special provision for it in Wisconsin. And John talked a little bit about it, but uh, Minnesota has done a couple projects already with VRAM. And so here are pictures from one of the first jobs they completed. This job was in Blue Earth County, uh, Minnesota Route 22. Picture on the left is when they applied it in September, 2018. And the picture on the right is when I went up to the project in November last year to check on it. And you can see they did a rumble strip, uh, but it's hard to even tell where the joint is. Um, I think it's also because they did that Maryland uh, notch wedge uh, there at the joint as well. But uh, the joint's holding up and performing great. And here's the second project they did in Minnesota 169 in Fairbolt County. And you can see the paving on top of the VRAM in this picture. And picture on the right is in November when I went to visit the project. And you can see, once again, they used a rumble strip, but the joint itself is holding up well. Uh, there's a slight opening, but that's typical what you would see. Uh, and you'll notice over the years as you go look at this project, it's not going to really open up any further than what you see because you have the VRAM right below that uh, joint that's going to make it impermeable. There's a little transverse crack, but nothing too, uh, too uh, important to worry about there. And so it was those two projects that Minnesota DOT studied with the help of Iowa State. They did a research project, uh, taking some field cores from the control section, as well as the VRAM section. And uh, Iowa State just recently published this December, 2020, uh, their findings. And the field cores containing VRAM, according to Iowa State, showed better results in the laboratory than the cores taken from the control section, and that they have higher joint bond energy, fracture energy, and good surface energy. So the high surface, and joint bond energies indicate that longitudinal cracking at the joints will be delayed relative to the control section because more energy will be needed for cracking to occur. So the cracking resistance at the joint may also have been improved as shown by the, excuse me, the high fracture resistance value. So really they're stating that they understand that the VRAM section is gonna outperform the control section and will most likely last longer. So. Minnesota DOT uh, was pleased with the results. And as John indicated, we're currently working with them on a special provision. I know they submitted a final draft to central office and I believe it's just kind of uh, language issues that they're working through right now, just making sure the wording and the special provisions uh, appropriate for the Minnesota DOT spec. Then also we, we just recently had a, TRB paper that was published by the Illinois DOT. Um, the Illinois DOT is currently using VRAM on all their HMA overlay projects. There's a lot of VRAM uh, being used in Illinois, or as they call it, LJS. But the paper showcases the research that IDOT did starting in the early 2000s to test the VRAM performance on their roads. And this paper really highlighted what the value is to an agency when you're using this product to kind of look at the life cycle cost. And their conclusion of the research was that IDOT determined the average life extension of the asphalt pavements by using VRAM would be three to five years, and also calculated that VRAM provides three to five times the value of the cost. And if anybody's interested, they can send me an email and I'll, uh, I can certainly provide them with a copy uh, of the TR, uh, TRB paper. And then here's a graph that was in that paper. I just want to show you guys. So this graph kind of highlights what that value is. So 
if you start here, this is kind of what the typical service life would be of 15 years in Illinois. And each year, as you go over to the right, this would be one additional year of service life for that pavement, three years of additional service life, and five years additional service life, as you can see. So the blue bar graph shows if they got one more additional service life of that pavement, the value of that to Illinois would be $6.46. They got three more years, the value would be $7.58. If they got five more years, it'd be $10.16. So when you compare that to the cost of VRAM, which in their projects, the average cost came out to be $2.39. You can see that how they came to that conclusion that they're getting three to five more years of additional service life. So that's going to be three to five times the cost of using VRAM on your projects. And this really showcases how it's an investment, long-term investment, not an expense for your jobs. And we've recently use this information from Illinois to develop a life cycle cost calculator that shows a traditional HMA treatment cycle versus a cycle using J-band. And you can look for an online version on our website in the next couple of weeks. We anticipate having that up on our website where you can punch in your agency's values and costs. And then it'll show you if you switch to using J-band on your projects, the potential savings you can find. And so here's an example that we did with the Indiana DOT using the numbers that they provided us from joint ceiling, which they have to do every three years, as you can see in the charts here. And you compare that to doing J-band and getting three more additional years of service life and not having to do any joint ceiling. You can see the savings that Indiana DOT could save is about $85,000 on a one mile paved project. So to wrap things up, um, these are the points I hope you learned from my presentation today. The first, VRAM is a material solution to improve performance at the joints. And it's gonna really help you reduce air and water permeability at the joints. Um, it's a proven technology. There's been multiple projects that have been in place for 15 plus years that demonstrate improved long-term joint performance. And VRAM, reduces the need for joint maintenance and increases the life of the payment. So really, just like I showed you in that life cycle cost calculator, you're going to be able to eliminate the maintenance you have to, you have to do every three to five years, and you're going to get additional service life. So we're really trying to figure out a way to reduce that joint maintenance that you have to do on the roadways. And VRAM increases the joint life, uh, reducing the need for maintenance, which will improve safety as well on the roads. So we're really trying to do what we can to make the uh, road safer for not only the drivers, but also the construction workers. And then lastly, we can help you run a life cycle cost analysis to prove the savings. So VRAM, we want you to understand is really an investment in your roads and not an expense. And with that, I know we're saving questions for the end. So um, yeah, I'll thanks. see if anything was posted, but I'll, uh, I'll wait for the Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. And um, you can go down and uh, look at the questions and type in your answers for the sake of time. And then we'll take any that do not get answered at the end. So we'll move on. And our next speaker is going to be uh, Craig Reynolds and Trey Wurst. Craig Reynolds has worked at Ingevity for seven years. Prior to joining Ingevity, he worked for Vulcan Materials for 18 years and has been involved in the asphalt industry since college. As a technical marketing manager, he markets special chemicals to the asphalt industry in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Trey Wurst is a technicalology development engineer at Ingevity based in North Charleston, South Carolina. 10 plus years of experience in the industry is focused on asphalt materials and pavements. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from Clemson where he has much of his graduate work focused on making asphalt mixes more sustainable using warm mix asphalt. With that, I will turn it over to Craig and Trey. Take it away. Hey everybody, hope you can, everybody can hear me on here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick and we'll, we'll get started.
see. Danny, can you see everything? Yes, we do. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So yeah, to to um, finish up our uh, three pronged uh, section today on uh, joint density, I'm going to talk a little bit about how WMA uh, chemical warm mix uh, impacts density, but specifically joint density. Um, and start out, we'll do a little brief history of uh, warm mix and kind of where we're at right now in our industry. We'll do um, look at kind of some of the joint density best practices, but we've hit on a lot of that with Dave and John. So I'll probably sk skim that section and keep that fairly short. Um, then we'll talk about how warm chemical warm mix impacts uh, density overall and joint density. And then we'll talk about some of the data that's out there and some of the studies that have been done with warm mix and, and joint density. And then we'll do, um, we'll do the questions and, and wrap up there at the end. So um, we'll jump right in here. Let's see, so probably a number of you have seen these uh, NAFA surveys and there's a lot of data packed in there and they do always do a section on warm mix. Um, this is uh, the one that was published 2019, 20, or 2020, I believe on the 2019 data. Um, but what you see here in this graph, you see the companies uh, using warm mix, it's really kind of plateaued, right? A lot of the companies that are interested in it have tried it in the last decade, but you also see in the second part, total tonnage going using warm mix is keen to increase. So same number of companies out there, right? But total tonnage going warm is increasing. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, the other piece of that is um, the, the technology used to make warm mix. So you go back 10 years ago, 90% plus of warm mix is done with foam. And you have about you know, less than 5% with a chemical additive in, in 2011. And now, 2019, you're at nearly 50-50 between additives, chemical additives, and foam. So more companies are doing more tonnage warm. More companies are doing more of that tonnage, more of that warm mix tonnage with additives. Um, why is that? Well, there's a ton of reasons people use warm mix, right? Um, we're going to talk about the impact on compaction. Um, you know, liquid answer, lime replacement, uh, long hauls, cold weather pavements, all those things. Um, but one of the big pieces of that, right, that we in and John and Dave hit on it is what improved density can do for your service life or your pavement. Um, we know, you know, this is the part I'm going to go through kind of fast. There's a lot of good resources out there on joint density, right? And, and there's a lot of good ones in the state of Minnesota specifically. Um, this is a this is a FHWA uh, summary that, that came out last year on joint density. Obviously, it hits on some of the issues of why there's an issue, right? The permeability at that spot. But it also goes through a lot of the um, different methods for um, mitigating joint density issues, right? So it talks a lot about some of the mechanical strategies and, and that, uh, that John talked to you a bit about, right? With the, the, the Maryland joint, um, the cutback um, edge joint, the, there's, the, there's a wedge theory that we haven't really talked much about that's popular in some, some areas. Um, this is a, a fixture you can put up, you know, different pavers that have different things to cut that joint or have different um, to create that wedge. There's all sorts of um, now things are coming out that um, Dave talked about, about um, yeah, filler materials to seal that joint and decrease permeability. Uh, this is a cool paper that came out a while back, um, 10 plus years ago, that NCAT and FHJW had looking at all these different methods and really cool. Um, you know, it, it, joint filler options were, were one of the things looked at here and that rated really well along with some of these different techniques. But it's cool to see our industry putting these together to create better density and, and less permeability of the joint. What we want to talk about specifically, though, is how warm mix can play a role in that. Has it played a role in that? And um, does, does uh, the, a chemical warm mix give you a better opportunity to create um, a better joint, a better joint for the service life of your pavement. Um, so this is some work that's really popularly referenced, right? This is a FHWA paper for a few years back. Ash and Brenner, others did this, but basically they did a field study on density, and they came up with a one percent increase in field density. So one percent better on density gives you up to ten plus ten percent bump in service life. That's huge, right? And and Dave had some similar numbers looking at you know decreasing the permeability of the joint. 
it more than pays for itself um, by in service life. The huge savings from this paper talked about. There were actually um, five states, I believe, that looked at warm mix as a part of this at the joint. Um, and all those states have some of the reports coming up that are specific to that. They either decreased temperature using warm mix and got the same uh, joint density as they did with their hot mix, or they kept their temperature hot, used the chemical warm mix and got improved joint density in two of those instances. So a pretty cool resource to look at how the warm mix improves workability and keeps the pavement um, compaction window open longer, which allows you to uh, which allows you to get better density across the mat, but also at your joints. How does that work? That's what, a little bit what we're talking about in a bit or next here. So joint density, how chemical warm mix improves density is really threefold. We talk about the effect of the chemistry, talk a little bit about how chemical warm mix changes your compaction window for your pavement, and then talk about how chemical warm mix uh, gives you more consistent uh, mat temperatures and how that affects your pavement. So starting out, some of you guys have probably seen some of these videos. We have a whole video series on this on uh, YouTube. You can reference and a link to the first one here is right here at the bottom of the bottom of these bullets. Um, but basically, the, the chemical warm mix, like um, like an EvaTherm, has uh, what we call surfactants in it. The same thing that it's in soap that works with your hands, right? You have the there's these little lollipop. You see these. Um, you know, a, a sphere with a tail, um, and the spheres like uh, the, you know, the the lollipop part of it is one. The head group with the the sphere is polar, and the tail is nonpolar, so they're attracted to different things, right? So um, one of them is attracted to the oil in your hands; the other is attracted to the water, so that makes it emulsifies um, all the oil in your hands, and everything's on your hands are washed off, right? So similar concept in warm mix, you still have these um, surfactants with the little lollipops, the head and the tail, but what you have is you overload that system with the dosage that they create. So the, the spheres are attracted to each other and then the tails are attracted to the asphalt. So you create these little micelles, which are kind of like these balls you see in the second picture here uh, of surfactants in there, which really create a lubricating effect in the binder. So you don't change viscosity but you create these lubricants in the system, these ball bearings that help you compact and keep your compaction window open longer. So this, uh, this the video series does a way better job than I just explained it. Um, it goes through about three or four parts. You can watch the different, different ones that are more specific to paving, but it's pretty useful actually. Um, if I were to play them all right now, I'd be like 10 minutes, so we're not doing that, but um, they're broken up into little like two minute sections that are pretty interesting. Uh, but the chemical energy in there replaces the heat energy, but allows you to get better workability, um, specifically providing workability at cooler temperatures, which is huge for joints, which are exposed in a lot of instances for a bit, and, and gives us better, um, you know, lower permeability at the joint. Um, the other thing that we talk about, that I talked about number two thing is the compaction window. So how does, how does a chemical warm mix uh, open up a compaction window? So in this example, this is, this is just a graph that's pulled from the Pave Cool software. And uh, a number of you are probably familiar with that. You could pull this up and, and put in all sorts of different assumptions for your project and see how long you have to do breakdown. I put in some just basic assumptions here for an illustration. Um, this is a project with a two inch lift, um, it's 50 degree temps, uh, no low, low wind, right? Five mile an hour wind, and it's a dense graded mix. So um, just typical assumptions. And what we did is I did a hot mix at 305, was an example from this project we did, and warm mix was 275. And we kept the compaction window the same as far as the, um, the, the amount of temperature in there. So 290 to 220, a 70 degree window for the hot mix and a 70 degree window for the warm mix, 260 to 190. What you see is, this basically goes off kind of the law of thermodynamics that hotter materials are further away from the air temperature and equilibrium. So they're trying to cool, they cool more quickly than cooler materials. So in this example, the hot mix arrives out, it's a short haul, so it gets out to the project 290. And we're trying to get our breakdown before it gets to about 220. We have 10 minutes, Pave Cool says, under this weather conditions with this mix and these, this lift thickness to get the compaction window. 
or to get the breakdown in the convection window that we want. So the Warmix example, exact same project, 30 degree down temperature shift. You have uh, 18, almost 20 minutes to get in the same uh, amount of space temperature wise to get your compaction. So the warm mix not only gives you that workability of the ball bearings and the surfactants in there, it opens up the compaction window longer so you have more time in it to roll your joint, um, roll, uh, you get better density in the map. Uh, the other piece of that, so the third piece of that, you're dealing with, uh, we talked about the chemistry in there, we talked about the compaction window, thermal segregation, similar concept to what we talked about a second ago with hotter materials cooling more quickly, losing heat faster. Here you have um, this project, very similar to the last one we talked about, we have mix coming out there as a short haul, so you have mix getting out there, some is at 300 degrees, some um, cooler spots, trucks had to wait, and you're down at 240 here, so you have a 60 degree difference in the mat, and just a, you know, what is this, a couple hundred feet, so and that's not a lot of distance. Uh, in the warm mix example, same project, mix gets out there, uh, a little bit cooler, and there's only about a 24 degree difference. So you have a 240 and let's see, there's a 225, something like that. So um, there's only, so your mix is all at the same temperature. Your compaction window is open longer and you have that chemical and energy in there replacing the heat energy allows, helps to get density, achieve density. It gives you a longer window to do that in. So several states have looked at this, um, to see how that impacts joint density. Uh, a couple of those, one of the really good ones on that is uh, was done in Kentucky uh, in about 10 years ago. Um, that's when the work started, it's published a couple years after that. You can look up this paper if you're interested. But if you look at this first, uh, well, let's look at this graph right here on the top. This is just shows the temperature difference. So they, the, the hot mix was placed about 300 and the uh, warm mix was placed at about 250. And they basically got the exact same density across the board. Uh, they averaged for both both pavement sections. So 50 degree temperature reduction, same density numbers. What's really interesting though, is you look at the densities by the cross-sectional location, we've talked about that, right? That um, the center line um, should be weaker where that joint is. And you see that here, six inches away, 18 inches away, you see better numbers. And 60 inches away, you're getting close to the edge, numbers are going back down. What's interesting with the warm mix, is the numbers are very consistent across the board. They had they achieved better center line joint densities by using warm mix, keeping their compaction window open longer. Um, that helped them in this in this example. They achieved about a one percent better, or let's see, about a half percent better joint density on average across the project. And they really maintained um, for all the different sections. The warm mix helped uh, mitigate some of that. Um, issue with the unconfined edges and stuff by allowing you to get packed longer there. Uh, permeability also, you saw uh, very s similar numbers and warm mix actually at a lot of the locations reducing the permeability of the mix by helping you get compaction, better compaction. Um, another project, this is from similar year, similar study looking at Connecticut. Um, they did a couple of different sections. They dropped, the, they're pretty aggressive with the temperatures. They dropped the temperatures um, a good bit on both projects. And this is an example here. So they had about a 300 control and they had about a 260 evotherm section. And what they saw, they get 90, 91s on the joint density with the evotherm. They had a couple of bad weather days that dropped a little bit. Uh, and they had 91s on their control section and very similar densities on their daily mats. But they, uh, what they saw is that they basically got this, they could drop their temperature with the exclusion of this study and still get the same density. Um, especially at the joint. Um, another cool thing though, that we talk about, it's good to highlight these two projects, their TSR using the warm mix, you get a, a liquid anastrip adhesion benefit a lot of time with these chemical additives. Uh, those numbers went up and their rut number stayed the same. So they are looking at, they could get same density with lower temperatures and improve their moisture resistance, which um, we know with the issues of permeability of moisture is really what was what killing the joints in those scenarios that we've talked about that John and, and David talked about a lot so far today. Um, another way to help improve that is to improve the moisture susceptibility of your mix. Um, so another cool study, last one I want to talk about, and I'll try to finish up fairly uh, 
quickly here is um, the, this is a more recent one done in the last couple of years. This paper was just published at TRB, I think last year, but looking at field density in Louisiana, um, but it's, it's just a good field study in general that, um, you know, one of the strategies right now with a lot of stuff is to add asphalt to your mix to help improve density. Well, that's often expensive. That requires redesign, those type things. What they saw in this study, they added two tenths AC and it performed the same or was outperformed by adding evotherm, adding a chemical warm mix to the mix to get better density. So their densities went up on both their binder course and the wearing course on their trial sections. And then when they do their test results, they do the, um, they, they do iFit with the, their, their semicircular bend, slightly different method there. Um, the chemical warm mix section um, outperformed the control and the plus AC section and on the wheel tracking uh, also outperformed on that. So better density, impacts your impacts the that a better density with the warm mix also shows up on your field uh, performance testing and you see that here so um cool things to think about as we take forward we're, we're we're constantly tasked with doing more than one thing at once right we want to get better permeability we want to get a tighter joint but we're also trying to meet a bunch of balanced mix design specs and that's one thing i think warm mix is really unique in how it can address both those things and that threefold way you add chemistry to remove a lot of the heat energy and then you add um with those you get the um the surfactant effect the ball bearings to help with the workability you open up the compaction window and make it larger so you have your paving crew is has more flexibility and more time to get the joint density required and then uh you have a more consistent map behind the paper so um Appreciate you guys' time here today. I know it was a quick one. If you um, want to reach out and talk about any of the data or things more specifically, you certainly do a, a deeper dive. Um, mine and Craig's email is there on the screen. So um, appreciate uh, uh, you guys in Minnesota uh, hosting this. And um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate that. And uh, three great presentations, folks, on uh, proactive measures of uh, making your longitudinal joints perform better. Uh, I was going to take a little bit of time and I appreciate this uh, little bit of time that's left to talk about reactive measures to uh, address longitudinal joint failures or distress in the field after they happen. And uh, just to emphasize, it's always better to take care of these issues proactively. And that's why we wanted to talk about these three topics today. But reactively, um, there's a number of things that have been tried, um, probably most commonly microsurfacing, which can be placed in the uh, longitudinal joint to help seal it up and uh, make it perform better after the fact. Uh, mastic sealers has been used quite significantly on these longitudinal joints. And then other types of uh, patching materials. Somebody has a question about poly patch. There's a, a great number of different types of patching materials that can be used. And these uh, types of reactive measures are covered in the um, pavement preservation course. And they all have uh, you know, different uh, costs and benefits associated with them. But I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, you know, they are out there. There's something that you can do to address the issue after the fact and help make your roads safer. One of the questions was about uh, any studies done on accidents. I think that when some of these longitudinal joints get deep enough and turn into linear potholes, they can cause accidents where people lose control of their car when their wheel drops into that uh, longitudinal distress. So it is a, a very important topic to, to cover both uh, on a reactive and a proactive basis. And so I would encourage you to attend the uh, pavement preservation course this winter. And as I mentioned, one of the reasons we wanted to do this uh, seminar today is to determine um, how much interest there would be in having a module added for these proactive measures for longitudinal joints added to the pavement preservation, pavement maintenance course that we do. So. If I could ask for everybody to go to the bottom of their screen and raise your hand 
if you think that it would be beneficial to uh, add a com condensed version of these proactive measures in that course, I would appreciate it so we get a head count. We currently have um, 82 participants still on the line. And if so you thought this added some value and provided you with some good information, please raise your hand now so we can uh, determine if we want to add these for the um, upcoming course. And I got a question for Catherine. Is there a way we can count how many hands are being raised now? Yeah, so right now there's 35, 36. Okay. Seven. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty pop that's about, like yes. <laughs> that's about half. So that means that uh, when half the people uh, feel there's value, that uh, justifies uh, going forward and incorporating a, a module into the course. I think um, we are. now ready to answer any questions that did not get answered. So if um, anybody has any questions they wanna ask audially, you can unmute yourself, I believe, and ask the question, or we can go to the uh, question and answers that have not been answered by typed in answers and, uh, and get them answered now. It, uh, Dan, this is uh, John. I just saw there was one question on the chat that I didn't see earlier. Why did the mat densities improve with the Maryland joint method? Um, 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 and then I would have expected better density in the joint, but how did the joint construction positively impact the uh, center lane mat? That, that's a good question. And um, the information I was showing today was um, after we had implemented the uh, Maryland joint method. And I, I think that, uh, again, whenever you introduce something new, the contractors pay special attention to to what whatever the new method is, and they they just seem seem to do to do better. But but I think what uh, um, what we noticed with the Maryland Joint Method was that uh, um, the uh, and and we did that along with uh, increasing our uh, our density requirement. So I I think those two kind of coupled hand hand in hand um, the Maryland Joint Method as well as an increased density requirement. Just um, the the contractors knew that there was a, a, a strict requirement on that and, and have paid more attention to it. But in terms of the Maryland joint, I think by forcing, by ensuring that there is material nice and tight against that longitudinal joint, um, I, I, th I think that has a, um, a, the positive Im impact on that. So, um, um, and, uh, and, and again, I, I think just because they had been paying attention to the longitudinal joint, it followed suit that mat density also increased. There, there really shouldn't have been a, a reason for mat density to increase, except other than the fact that the roller is, uh, you know, when they're hitting the joint, they're hitting a certain amount of the, uh, the mat density as well. So I hope that an answered that. So thanks, Dan. Very good. Thank you, John. I uh, believe that Dave Stanzak would like to answer a question. Yeah, I was just typing in to Bridget, who was asking about some of the update changes to Illinois DOT that she just made me aware of. And so, yeah, I'm aware that there's some updates in 2019 that I believe there was some changes to the uh, uh, application rate to the Illinois specs as well in, in those updates. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, one thing that uh, you know, I would like to ask John Garrity in regards to you know some of these processes, these proactive processes, and you know warm mix being one, um, Minnesota's kind of got a permissive spec in terms of utilizing some of these things. Maybe John, you could elaborate a little bit about uh, what the permissive spec is and and uh, that it is up to the various agencies to utilize these special provisions if they want to incorporate them into their project. Okay, okay thank, thanks, Dan. Um, yes, as, as uh, Dan mentioned, um, MnDOT's spec is permissive with regard to uh, warm mix technology. So it's essentially what 
that's saying is that um, a contractor can elect to use um, uh, any warm mix uh, method um, that uh, is is available. And all, all what we want to know on the MnDOT side is when uh, a warm mix additive is being used because um, uh, when, when warm mix is being produced at a lower mix, that affects what the laboratory compaction temperatures are for um, determining the uh, the air void so so that's what uh, what what we really need to to know and um, uh, Minnesota does not pay for warm mix additives and um, so uh, that's that's one of the uh, I guess glitches in in a sense I know some states will pay for the uh, warm mix additives but uh, um, MnDOT doesn't uh, pay for them. Is that what you were looking for, Dan? Or? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good answer. I know North Dakota uh, pays for warm mix additives when it's utilized uh, late season. And that's when you need to get those better densities. It's much more difficult to get densities. I think all the speakers showed the uh, benefit of getting better densities and that some of these different types of technologies and products can uh, really help you achieve those better densities and the benefits uh, pay for themselves over time. So I guess the message is if uh, you want to benefit from these technologies, then get the uh, special provisions uh, from MnDOT or from the uh, folks speaking today, get them incorporated into your projects up front and, uh, and realize the benefits that they offer. Um, it Dan, can I, um, I was just thinking, um, there was a question about, uh, um, um, uh, you know, compacting from the cold side. And I, I sent that back in a chat and then also attached to that same question was um, what's called pinching the joint or the Asphalt Institute recommends that that first uh, roller pass be uh, about six inches away from the longitudinal joint. And, and I tried answering that on the chat, but they must only give you so many words. So I, I was unable to answer that one. But in, in response to that, uh, yes, there, there are some people who um, uh, recommend recommend pinching the joint. And, and again, that's where the first roller pass is about six inches away from the joint with the idea being that that, that uh, kind of is locking that edge then. So in, in a sense, they feel that you've made a confined edge six inches away and now you've got that confined edge of the longitudinal joint. So the, the next roller pass would be directly over that uh, pinched area. And they're assuming that that pinched mix um, kind of humps up a little bit. And the idea being with that roller coming over the humped up mix, now it's going to be um, uh, basically compressed into that confined edge of the longitudinal joint and that confined edge that was made um, six inches away with that first roller pass. And in Minnesota, we, we have tried that, but oftentimes we see a, a, a stress uh, fracture or a, a stress stress uh, crack develop um, on that uh, six inch line. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's with mixed tenderness or not, but uh, um, the, 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 we, we don't uh, say a contractor can't use pinch the joint, but we've noticed that uh, most contractors in Minnesota prefer just to make that first pass with the uh, drum hanging six inches over the, the joint, just because um, it, it, if, if we have a, a crack that's developing while they're paving, we tell the contractor that that's, that's not acceptable. And uh, you know they're either gonna have, have to fix that or we tell them they're not gonna be allowed to pave if they're a roll, if they're going to continue with, uh, with a crack forming. So um, I hey. hope that answers. Yeah, thank you, John. I'd have to say I've seen research back when they were looking at all kinds of joint configurations on density and the pinch joint, I think was either the bottom or towards the bottom of these different uh, processes that you can use with, in terms of the results that you get. And so with that, I appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, I think that we've got all the questions answered. So Catherine, unless you have uh, something else to wrap things up, I think we can close this down. I don't. Thank you to our panelists, Trey, Dave, Craig, and John, and Dan for moderating today's session. Um, we will be sending out, as soon as you log off uh, the meet webinar, you'll be prompted to answer a survey. If you could do that for us, that helps us um, continue to improve our courses. So that would be wonderful. And yeah, I wish everyone to have a great day.
And this will be available uh, yes. recording? Yep, so the recording will be available. I'll send a link. Everyone will get a, my, an email tomorrow thanking you for attending and the link will be in there as well. So if you want to pass it on to someone who wasn't here today, you can do that. Very good. Thank you everybody and have a great day. Thank you everyone.